Eight Mistakes Every Investor Should Avoid by Warren Buffett Warren Buffett, called the world's best investor, has been investing for a long time. He began when he was 11 years old and is now 90 years old. So we have 79 years of investing experience to draw upon. He's made a lot of mistakes and seen a lot of mistakes that the average investor makes over the years. Hello and welcome back to Wealthology. For today's video, we'll let Warren Buffett explain the 8 mistakes every investor should avoid. Let's get started. Number 1. Buying cheap stocks or poor quality Well, I have made a lot of mistakes. Biggest mistake? Well, not the biggest necessarily, but biggest. But buying Berkshire Hathaway itself was a mistake because Berkshire was a lousy textile business and I bought it very cheap. I'd been thought by Ben Graham to buy things on a quantitative basis, look around for things that are cheap, and that I was taught that will say in 1949, or they made a big impression on me. So I went around looking for what I call use cigar butts of stocks. And the cigar butt approach to buying stocks is that you walk down the street and you're looking around for cigar butts, and you find this obviously this terrible looking soggy ugly looking cigar one puff left in it but you pick it up and you get your one puff disgusting you throw it away but it's free i mean it's cheap and then you look around for another soggy you know a one puff cigarette well that's what i did for years it's a mistake uh Although you make money doing it, but you can't make it with big money. It's so much easier just to buy wonderful businesses. So now I would rather buy a wonderful business at a fair price than a fair business at a wonderful price. Number 2. Dancing in and out of stock and the question we get most frequently from people about you coming on is, what should they be buying right now? So if I say buy, you say, I say basically whole. I mean the idea that the European news or slow down in this or that or anything like that. That would not cost you if you owned a good farm and had it run by a good tenant. You wouldn't even sell it because somebody said, here's a news item. You know, this is happening in Greece or something of the sort. If you owned an apartment house and you got to raise your rent a little as well located you had a good manager, you wouldn't dream of selling it. If you had a good business personally, the local McDonald's franchise, you know you would you wouldn't be thinking about buying or selling it every day. Now when you own stocks, you own pieces of businesses and they're wonderful businesses. You can pick the best businesses in the world. And to buy or sell on current news is just crazy. You're in a wonderful business and you got people running it for you. You know you're going to do well over 5 or 10 years and do think news events should cause you to try and dance in and out of some Something that's a wonderful game is a terrible mistake. So get into a bunch of wonderful businesses and stay with them. Number 3. Buying Airline Stocks I went in the US Air, I bought a preferred stock in 1989. As soon as my check cleared, the company went into the red, never got out. I mean, it was a really dumb. I mean, I've got an 800 number I call now. Whenever I think about buying an airline stock, I call them up any hour. That, fortunately, I call them at 3 in the morning. And I just dial and I say, my name's Warren, I'm an airaholic. You know what I'm thinking about buying this thing and they talk to me down? I mean, it, it takes hours sometimes, but it's worth it. Believe me. If you ever think about that airline buying an airline stock, call me. And I'll give you the 800 number because you don't want to do it. 
Number four, buying stocks high and selling low. Investors behave in very human ways, which is they get very excited during bull markets. And they look in the rearview mirror and they say, I made money last year. I'm going to make more money this year. So this time I'll borrow, you know, or the neighbor says, you know, I wasn't in last year when that neighbor was dumber and I made a lot of money. So I'm going to go in this year. So they're always looking in the rear view mirror and when they look in the rear view mirror and they see a lot of money having been made in the last few years they pull in and they just push and push and push on prices and when they look in the rear view mirror and they see no money having been made they just say this is a lousy place to be so they don't care what's going on in the underlying business and it's astounding but that's that makes for a huge opportunity just huge opportunity i mean i've lived through roughly half in an investing sense about half that period and i've had that long period of stagnation from 48 i mean from 65 to 82 17 years i wrote an article for forbes in 1979 i just said how can this be pension funds in the in 1970s put a hundreds and some percent of their new money in stock because they were wild about stocks then they got a lot cheaper and they put a record low in nine percent of their net new money and in 1978 then when stocks were way cheaper people behave very peculiarly in terms of their reactions because they they're human beings and they get excited when others get excited they get greedy when others get greedy they get fearful when others get fearful and they'll continue to do so and you will know you will see things you won't believe in your lifetime and securities markets number five pulling the trigger on a stock I was just wondering what is, what would you consider to be the worst investment you've ever made? The worst investment I ever made, the biggest mistakes, are the ones that are actually don't show up. They're the mistakes of omission rather than commission. We've never lost that much money on any one investment, but it's the things that I knew enough to do that I didn't do. We have missed profits of as much as, you know, maybe $10 billion in things that I knew enough to do and I didn't do it. Number six, waiting for a market crash. Unless you find the prices of a great company really offensive, if you if you feel you've identified it, and by definition a great company is one that's going to remain great for 30 years, it's going to be great a great company for three years. You know, it ain't a great company, I mean it. So you really want to go along with the idea of something that if you were going to take a trip for 20 years, you wouldn't feel bad by leaving the money in with no orders with your broker and no power of attorney or anything and you just go on a trip and you know you come back and it's going to be a terribly strong company i think it's better just to own them i mean you know we could we could attempt to buy and sell some of the things that we own that we think are fine businesses but they're too hard to find i mean we found c's candy in 1972 where we find here and there we get the opportunity to do something but they're too hard to find so to sit there and hope that you buy them in the in the trios of some picnic you know that you'd sort of take the attitude of a mortician you know, waiting for a flu epidemic or something, I mean it. I'm not sure that's a well-to-be-great technique. You know, I think if you like the business and you like the person who's coming to you and the price sounds reasonable and you really know the business, I think probably the thing to do is to take it and don't worry about how it coded. And it won't be coded tomorrow or next week or next month. I think people's investment would be more intelligent if you know stocks were coded about once a year but it isn't going to happen that way number seven buying great stocks on a small scale 
we don't do very many things but when we get the chance to do something that's right and big we've got to do it and even to do it in a small scale is just a big mistake almost is not doing it at all i mean you've really got to you got to grab them when they come because they you're not gonna get 500 great opportunities you would be better off if when you got out of school here you got a punch card with 20 punches on it and every big financial every financial decisions you made you used up a punch you get very rich because you think through very hard each one he went to a cocktail party and somebody talked about a company he didn't even understand what they did or couldn't pronounce the name but they made some money last week and another one like it you wouldn't buy it if you only had 20 punches on that card there's a temptation to dabble if particularly during bulls markets in stocks it's so easy you know it's easier now than ever because you can do it online you know just you click it in and maybe it goes up a point and get excited about that and you buy another one the next day and so on you can't make any money over time doing that but if you had a punch card with only 20 punches you weren't going to get another one in the rest of your life you would think a long time before every investment decision and you would make good ones that you'd make big ones and you probably wouldn't even use all the 20 punches in your lifetime but you wouldn't need to number eight allowing the madness of crowds the country will do very well over time but you will see these huge waves and if you can stay objective throughout that if you can detach yourself temperamentally from the crowd, you get very rich and you won't have to be very bright. I mean it, I'm sure you are, but you want, you know, it just, it doesn't take brains, it takes temperament. It takes the ability to sit there and look at something. When I started out in 1950, I would go through and find things at two times earnings and they were perfectly decent businesses and people wanted jobs and those companies and everybody knew they were gonna be around and they wouldn't buy them at two times earning and that's when interest rates were two and a half percent you know i went to the i started selling securities when i was 21 and a kansas city life insurance company happened to be a fairly prominent company in omaha and the policies they sold you if you were buying life insurance from them had a built-in assumption of 2% interest. The stock of Kansas City Life was selling at less than 3 times earning. You're getting 35% if you brought a stock. No question about the soundness of the company. I went to the local agent. I thought I figured hell be, I'll be able to sell him a few shares of stock. I mean the guy would understand him. He's got his whole life invested in his company. I went to local agent. We've been with him for 20 years and his name was Moose. I said, Mr. Moose, I said, you know, you're selling these policies with 2%. You may even have a few on members of your own family. And you can buy into this company whose paycheck you depend on every month. And you know, and whose future you, your beneficiaries, and these life policies depends on and who you're selling them. You know, 2% investment on you, you get 35% on your money. Yes, yeah, sudden you know stocks aren't any good and i couldn't i couldn't tell you you know i was a lousy salesman i mean well you have to start with that but it just blew me away it blew me away i thought sometimes i used to wonder if i was nuts you know because the truth is you may save a lot of money if you avoid making these typical financial blunders a mistake can cost you 20 percent 50 percent or even 100 percent of your investment and it can take years or 10 of years to recover as a result it's critical that we don't merely follow the crowd we don't wait for a crash before succumbing to fear and greed or dancing in and out of equities because these errors might lose us a lot of money it always helps when we can learn from history's greatest investor
So as an investor, which Warren Buffett's advice do you think is the most useful in correcting and avoiding the mistakes you've been making for years? Please let me know in the comments section below. And if you enjoy this video, please give it a thumbs up, ring the bell, and subscribe to our channel for more like it. Thank you for taking the time to watch. Stay tuned for our next video.